Muy buenas tardes y muchas gracias por, por venir. Hoy tenemos un, un poco más de reto en este evento porque lo vamos a hacer en inglés. Eh, Rainer Zitterman es nuestro invitado, que luego explicaré un poco en inglés para que él nos entienda eh, lo, lo que ha hecho y es un, una personalidad interesantísima que ha escrito muchísimos libros. Y me parecía que era, que era muy importante poder estar con él y para poder hacerlo pues tenemos que recorrer este medio camino en el idioma. Él se acerca a nosotros al inglés y nosotros a él porque él es alemán, pero yo creo que se va, que se va a entender. Es importante que se escuche bien. Eh, yo creo que se, si alguien no escucha bien, que lo, que lo diga. Y, y bueno, luego cuando acabemos, como siempre, tendremos un cóctel, un cóctel arriba. Rainer, right, switching to English, welcome. And it's been a pleasure for us to have you here. Uh, I was telling about you that you are a, um, a very uh, special personality because uh, you are uh, a very uh, productive uh, writer. You have written a lot of books, but also you are an entrepreneur. You did very well uh, creating your own company, which you sold. You do many things, and uh, well, it's a pleasure for us to have you here. You have uh, written many books, and, and today we are going to focus in the last one, uh, the, uh, published in Spanish, that is Libertad Financiera in Spanish, that is uh, Financial Freedom in English. And uh, for me, it's very interesting have, having you here because I want you to be more with, with us because you have to go through many of the other books that you have written and, and part of the books that you have al already done but are not still uh, translated into Spanish. So I hope this is going to be your first time here of many. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for inviting me. And as a first question, in, in this uh, uh, auditorium, we, we always ask somebody who, have, who has written a book the same question is uh, why, uh, in this case, uh, why a person like you is willing to to write so many books about the the concept of wealth in general? Yes, there are two reasons. Um, first of all, there are a lot of books how to become rich. I think you find hundreds of these books. But a lot of these books are written by people who are not self-made rich themselves. Some of them are even not rich. And I think <laughs> if, if, if you know anything about it and you write these books and you're so smart, why are you not rich? So I became rich as a self-made entrepreneur and investor. I had not, nothing. I inherited nothing. It's all self-made. And the next thing is, the next difference between this book and other big books, I looked for a lot of books um, about, you know, like scientific research about this topic, but I found nothing. And I wrote my, you know, I have two PhDs, one in history and the other in sociology. And my second doctoral dissertation was about the wealth elite uh, based on interviews with 45 super rich people. And so I think uh, this is the difference between this book and other books. I think it's simple to understand. Everyone who can understand newspaper here can understand the book. But it's based not only on opinion, it's based on scientific research and based on, and it's based on uh, own experience. And so I'm very happy. It's very successful in Germany since a lot of years and also very, very successful in China. You know, people there are very crazy with this idea to become rich in China. I had a lot of lectures there. I remember one time, it was in Shenzhen, and they invited me in the in a university. This was not a big university, only with 1,000 students, but it was Friday late evening at, at 8 p.m., and they invited me to talk about this book. And I think in Germany, I would be happy if maybe 10 people come or something. Mm -hmm. There were 850 people, almost everyone, and it was hours and hours because they were so fascinated by these ideas. Okay, in, in this book, let's go to this book, Financial Freedom, or Libertad Financiera, you, you talk about two, two things, two themes, that are uh, how to create a wealth and also how to preserve 
wealth. And the question is, what's, what is more difficult, to create wealth or to preserve? Most people think that it's more difficult to become rich than to stay rich. They think if I'm rich, nothing can, can happen. And the family office, they tell them, we do everything and the investment funds and everything, everyone tells them. And people who are not rich, they think always, when I have 1 million or even 10 million or 20 million, this is the hardest thing and then it's easy, but it's not, it's wrong. You see a lot of wealthy people who are not able to, to stay rich. In most cases, you can't read in the newspapers about them because you read more the success stories when someone became rich. But of course, if these are famous uh, pop stars or soccer players, and then you hear a lot of uh, them. The last example was from Germany. I think everyone knows here Boris Becker, the tennis star. He made something like 200 million and he lost all. He lost all. So it, it doesn't matter how, how much, whether you have 1 million, 10, 20, 200, you can lose everything. And you know, he came in prison, and I saw an interview in German TV when he, one year, or no, not one year, it was only two or three weeks after he left prison, and he had an interview. And then he said one sentence that was very important. He said, I never cared about money all of my life. It was never important to me. And I would tell him, here, this is the reason why you lost it. <laughs> because imagine, for example, I would tell my girlfriend, oh, she was never really important to me. It's what would she do? She would leave, of course. Yeah. And if I say the same to money, money leaves. Yes, if you don't like money, money don't like you. In, in this book, you, you, um, you make a relationship between money and happiness, which is the... the the classic and the, the one of the the main paths that we try to to look for when, when or to use when we look for happiness. Uh, there is a sentence in your book about uh, Gertrude Stein, which I think is quite good. So she says that I was have been rich and have been poor. It's better have been rich. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. I, I know I don't know whether we have this saying in Spanish, but I think similar we have it in a lot of language, like money alone doesn't make you happy. Of course, it's true. And I never found someone who said money alone makes me happy. I never saw that. But mm -hmm. it's also true for health, for example. Does make health alone you happy? No. Is health not important for this reason? Or the same with you can say, sex alone doesn't make me happy. So, okay, for, let's forget about sex. It doesn't make me happy alone. I never heard something saying things like this. It's only about money. Yes, and of course, it's true. But on the other hand, it's also true that money is important. And um, I don't know whether someone... Have you seen this uh, movie with Will Smith, The Pursuit of Happiness? So it's one of my favorite movies. Ha has anyone here who's seen this movie? It's a great movie. I can recommend. I saw a lot of people saw it. I can recommend. And you see how important, really, money is for him, especially if it's not enough money. It becomes more and more important if you don't have uh, enough of it. And, um, you know, for me, of course, the question is for what do you need money? If your motive is to buy a expensive watch or great car. So for me, this was not the most important uh, motive. For me, the most important uh, motive was freedom, to be free, you know. I decide today whether I work, <laughs> where I work, with whom I work, what I work, whether I work at all. Uh, I prefer, for example, to make a nap every day I can do it, so it's all, no one else, and this means freedom for me. And if you then don't ask, does money make you happy? But if you ask, does freedom make you happy? I think almost everyone would agree, of course, freedom <laughs> makes me happy. And so for me, it's money only one tool, it's not the only tool, but an important tool for being free. The, the, in, in Avante, in this company that we created 22 years ago, our main theme since the beginning is uh, to work with our clients in the relationship with money. 
the relationship uh, uh, money and, and happiness and, and being rich is a relationship. You can have money, you may have money, but may, may not be uh, complete. In this, uh, in, in this approach, what we have found is that money is always a concern. It, it, this is something that you uh, tell in your, in your book. When there is not enough money is a concern, when there are a lot of money also is a, a different concern, but also is a concern. Yes, it depends, you know, if you are, if you have a lot of money and you spend a lot of money, then there's not so much changing in your life because if you have always the fear what happens if I lose, this, if I have not this income, but if you have a lot of money and then you have maybe a moderate living style, I don't mean like living like poor or so, but um, for example, I have here, I think, a good watch, but it's the same since uh, 15 years. I have also a Bentley, but it's the same as 15 years. It's, it's not so important for me. There are some things I spend a lot of money, but um, of course, if you're so extreme, like these people to, to show off, like sometimes with some Russian people or some Asian people, you want to show everyone what I have and spending so much, this means, of course, then money is also uh, too, too important, and then you are in a similar situation as someone who's poor. There is in, in your in your book you mention um, a colleague that is uh, an American, uh, two of, two of them that wrote a book uh, many years ago that was uh, the title was Millionaire Next Door. Mm -hmm. These uh, these two people they were Thomas uh, Stanley and William Danko, and you mention another book that I think I think is interesting to to go a bit deeper, uh, in which they uh, they write about. Uh, that thing of, um, and the, the title of the book is Stop Acting Rich, that in Spain should be translated as a, something like Deja de hacerte el rico. And, uh, uh, the, like, uh, the meaning is uh, stop uh, um, trying to, 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 to appear as a, as a rich. No? Yes, this is and, and I think it's related. Uh, with what you were talking, because sometimes um, you you f try to to catch up, but you never never get to to the position because you are always living a bit ahead of, of what you or what you can. No? And so I saw a funny a funny uh, picture of some only some days ago. It was funny. There were two people. One wearing always like uh, brands and something, shoes and so, and the headline was poor man. And then there was another one, you know, dressed like I am today, and this was rich man. <laughs> mm. Mm. You, know, so. you, you, know what I, you know what I mean, Some, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> of course, there are also rich people who dress better than me, but you know, this is some, <laughs> some, some, some people who really want to show every, everything. I have to show here my car and this car and this car and this car, but people who are really wealthy, they, 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 they don't have to show to, to everyone. They know that they are rich, and other people maybe also know, but they don't have to show off in, in, this, in this way. So this uh, this attitude is 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 very important. So so this uh, um, uh, further on this idea, you in, in your book you talk. Also, you have written other books explaining that there is a there is different inequality in the in the size of on the amount of money. And the, we call millionaire someone with one million. We call millionaire someone with thirty million, and we call Millionaire, also some, someone with uh, some hundred millions, and you you make a difference between those situations. In your book, yes. uh, the, the wealth elite, you explain that very well. No? Uh, so, so you know, we had it. It's a long time ago that one million euros was a lot of money. Maybe mm -hmm. it was thirty or forty years ago when you spoke about I want to be a millionaire. But <laughs> what is one million today? Even if you are able with, I mean, with safe investments like, uh, you know, like bonds or something like this, to have maybe three three percent 
after inflation, after taxes, even this is very challenging, but even maybe you have 3% three, 3 after taxes, and um, so then it means you have every month, you, you have then in a, in a year 30,000, and every month 2,500 euros. I think this is not how wealthy people want to live with 2,500 euros the month. So my limit for my for my doctor dissertation was the lowest was 10 million, but there were only few people. Most of them had between 30 million and one one billion. And so I I, I wouldn't call someone really rich who has uh, one million euros. A lot of people um, they 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 think it's a lot of money, but um, in reality, of course, there's not a single definition of what is rich, what is super rich, but for my doctoral dissertation, it was this, at, at least he should have uh, 10 million. Well, you say also in your book that uh, there are different meanings of being rich. You know? being, uh, having enough money for your retirement could be a way of, of being rich and you don't need maybe that much. You know? there, are, there are many... It ways of, yes, it uh, depends how long you want to live, yeah. of course. Well, yeah. <laughs> and and my, my, you know, I, as, I think... As, as much as possible, but... Yes, uh, but if you make... I know some people, they make a calculation when they are 60, about like average 80 year, and I think then they have programmed their subconscious minds that they should live too long, because if they live longer than 80, uh, all yeah. this calculation is wrong. And, uh, you know, my grandmother, she was 106 years old, my, uh, and my grand-grandmother, she was 97 years old. My mother still lives with 91, and so I, I hope to be uh, 100. I, I don't know. And so uh, it, it depends how long you want to live. Of course, if you are 60 and you die with 65, and then you have 1 million, everything's good, no problem. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to the, to the um, uh, how to get rich, to the, to the part in which you, you establish your seven laws or, or financial success. But before talking us about the, those laws, you have a point about three things that uh, uh, normally people think are um, affect the, the situation of become rich that are lack, education and, and the investment in the, in the stock market. For you, those uh, uh, typical explanations doesn't fit very well. No? Um, yes, to, to explain what I mean, uh, do we have one of my books here? Yes. Can you give me one? But uh, no, I think this was Euro with uh, I signed for you. No, I need another one that is not signed for him. Do we have one? Uh, no, but, it's el mismo. but it belongs to someone, oh? Yes. Okay, I, I, I need someone that belongs to no one. I, no, I need no, a you. Hey, 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 get another one. Okay, so, so my but question now, who, who, who want to have this book now? Who want to have it? Who want to have this book? Who want to have it? <laughs> okay, this is like an experiment that did not work, and I can explain you why. <laughs> <laughs> it did not work. Because it's but, Spain, no? Maybe. But, but I, 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 I will sit down after this, but I want to explain why it did not work. Sometimes experiments did not work. You know, I, I do it very often, whether I speak to 50 people or 500, and I ask who want to have this book. And not everyone understands that you get it for free. Of course, then it would be too easy if I say, please come and get it for free. They don't know. And some people think, oh, what does he want to say? So I, I don't understand it. Can I get it or not? And then 
Some people think, yes, maybe I get it for free, but they are not sure, and they don't want to make a fool out of themselves, running here, and in the end, they get no book or something like this. And in a lot of cases, it happens, this was the exception, that it's not someone from the first row, but from the middle, or even from the last row, that someone to take it this won't. book. Mm -hmm. And then it's because we speak about luck and coincidence. If it would be only about luck and coincidence, only I think you and you would have a chance to get the book because it's the fastest and here it was close to, to this because you got the book. But in a lot of cases, it's there that even, I had one time that someone from the last row took the book. So, I said, so what does it mean? Um, it's important first to recognize whether there is an opportunity to recognize. A lot of people, and I'm included, we are blind, we go to, and, and we don't recognize opportunities. <laughs> this is what entrepreneurs do. They recognize there's an opportunity. But of course, it's not enough to recognize this. The next thing is to act, to do something. And so I don't believe in luck, uh, because I never met someone who was lucky all over his life, had good and bad luck. In most cases, sometimes we have good luck, sometimes we have bad luck. On average, it's even each uh, other out. And so, um, uh, because this point is very important, please allow me to add uh, one thing to, to show why it is so important. I'll tell you a story about a man. He was born 1930 in the United States. Plague, what was much bigger issue in 1930 than it is today. Mm -hmm. And he, um, he never met his father. His mother died when she was 31 years old. His brother died in front of his eyes when he was six years old. And then he became blind in the age of seven years old. Who knows this man? We have heard about him. Stevie no? This is not Stevie Wonder? Pardon? Ray Charles. Stevie Wonder is also blind, but he was blind when he was born. But, but uh, Ray Charles became blind. With Ray Charles, according to the official list, the most successful male singer in history, very, very rich, with earned hundreds of millions, I think today it would be billions, rich, well, uh, wealthy. But, you know, it, it is not about good or bad luck. I wrote another book about successful disabled people and that I interviewed with one who was blind and he was the first blind man to climb the Mount Everest and this was not enough he climbed the seven summits the seven highest mountains seven continents in spite of being blind and I have a friend he is born with no arms he has no arms but he's one of the most famous <coughs> harness in the world he travels all over the world so I don't believe in, good, they had bad luck, being blind, being poor, and, and all these things, no arms, no, but this is not so important. I, 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 don't, I don't believe it. Of course, sometimes it's, it plays a role, we have good or bad luck, but on average, I don't believe in it. This, this was the first uh, misconception about how to become rich, being lucky. And about education? Yes, education. I, in, I had these interviews with 45 rich people, Some of them were very good at school and university. Some of them very, very bad. Some of them even never graduated from high school. And one of the richest I spoke with, he was not even able to, to read and write probably. He had some problems reading and writing, but he had almost one billion uh, uh, self, self-made. And I, I have a friend, his net worth is uh, five billion. He became rich with milk and yogurt, and he has very low uh, ed education. And another friend who has three billion, also very low uh, education. So, of course, there are other people. So I have one friend, he's uh, the founder of uh, Capri Sun. He has even PhD. So it's not really a problem or bad if you are uh, educated and if you have a PhD. But it's really not, uh, not important. The result was there's no relation between your education on the one hand and uh, your later financial success on the other hand. This is, uh, there are other things that are much more important. Going, going to your laws, that uh, seven laws that are uh, characteristics, are things that you have found 
in people when you did your research. And I, I want, I, I, I'm going to be through them and I want you to, to, to explain to us. The first one that you, um, that you, uh, you say that setting great goals is for you one of the things that uh, are characteristic of these successful people. If I just read the biography about Elon Musk, have, has anyone read the biography about Elon Musk? It's amazing, I can, ima I can recommend, it's that so great. You know, after he, when he was very young, he sold PayPal, his first company. He was sitting there around with other people and one of his colleagues asked him, and what is next or what are you doing? And I said, uh, I think I want to conquer Mars and make a human to a multiplanetary species. <laughs> hey, you are nuts, you are, you are crazy. But today he has the most successful rocket company in the world. His rocket, the Starship, is much better than was the Saturn V that brought people to the moon. And he earns a lot of money with this, and he has concrete plans to go to Mars. This is about big goals. Or an, an, another one, um, I don't know whether some of you have uh, seen on Netflix the movie about Arnold Schwarzenegger. Has someone seen it? Arnold Schwarzenegger movie? I can strongly recommend about his life. This is someone who wrote down every year his goals. And, you know, he came from, a, a, his father was a policeman, a little bit difficult family from a small village in Austria. And when he was very young, he, he said, I want to be the biggest bodybuilder in the world. And they laughed at him. His parents even said, we have to go to... To, to the doctor with him, some of this crazy bodybuilding. Well, at this time, bodybuilding was only for very shady people who oil their muscles and so they, So And then, but he went to the United States and became the most successful bodybuilder in the world. And after he reached this goal, he said, I want to be a Hollywood superstar. And I forget it. Look at your body. No one wants to see it's like Dustin Huffman, not body like you, and you're excellent. No one can understand you. Your, your, your accent was even much stronger than my accent uh, today. And then your name, Arnold Schwarzenegger, no one can, can pronounce it, F forget it. Y you will never reach it. And his first movies were very, I think he got an award for the, uh, for the worst movie in this year. So it was, not, mm. it, it, it was not easy for him. But in the end, he, for example, with this movie Twins, only with this movie he earned 30 million uh, dollars. And so he was successful. He became one of the best paid movie stars in the world. And then he said he wanted to go to politics. And I think his aim would be to be president of the United States, but this is impossible for, you know, if you're not born in the United States, uh, according to the Constitution, you can't get it. But he was two times governor of California, what was the fifth uh, biggest economy in the world this time. So it's a great movie, and, yet, and it starts the movie with the most important thing is to set yourself big goals. And he starts, I didn't know this story, the movie that uh, the man, the first man who climbed the Mount Everest, and when he was at the top, <coughs> what he thought... They asked him, what did you think when you were there? He, he, thought, he said, I saw far away another mountain, very difficult to go on, and I thought about how to go there. This was the first thing that he saw. So I think goals are very important. I said it on the first because I think what you reach in life, it's everything depends on how big are your goals everything, and it was also with me, you know. I was successful uh, as an historian, I wrote books and so, but I had absolutely no money, zero, because I spent everything and uh, I had no, not any connection to, to, to money. And there was a time in my life where I had some problems and then I was, uh, I walked around with a famous German politician and he told me, you should earn some, become really rich to earn some money, then you are, you are free to express your opinion, if, even if you are non-conformist like I am, it's easier. But it's convincing, I'll be rich. And then um, this was a decision, but I didn't know how. But the most important thing was to make the decision, and I mean a real decision. I started to read books, 
and I go to seminars, and then I was in one seminar. At this time, I had a little bit, like 50,000. And then he, the, the, the leader of the seminar asked, please write down your goal, how much money you want to have. And he added something, please not too low, because it's very unlikely that you will get more later than you write down. So, OK, and I wrote down 10 million. This was Deutschmarks at this time. So, and at this time, I was really, it was really, oh, 10, 10 million, you, you can't imagine, even if you have 50,000. And today, if I would have only 10 million, I would think, oh, something is wrong with me. I'm getting poor. So it's, so, <laughs> it's about, you know, writing down your goals. I do it every New Year's Eve. You should do it the same way. Write, write down your goals every New Year's Eve, even your financial goals, a, a number not... <laughs> I, I want to be happy, or I want to be healthy, or I want to grow rich. Your subconscious mind doesn't understand it. It's like if you order on, on Emerson, please send me something nice that <laughs> makes fun for me. Okay, we, we don't know what to send you. It has to be concrete, like I want to have 10 million, for example, or 100 million, or what, whatever. So big goals, for me, the most important thing. The, the second law, and I agree very much on, on that and, and also I think talking to people this is uh, one thing that many many people I, I could say even most of the people don't think they are good at, at this that is uh, sales talent for you having uh, the capacity of being a good, a good salesman is crucial to, to become to have success in general absolutely sales is so important. Sometimes I ask people, are you good in sales? Then, no, I'm, I'm not because I'm not the guy to talk somebody in something that he doesn't want and anyway I'm not so good in, in talking. You know, I talk a lot today but when I sold for my company, I talked not so much as today. I was more like you, <laughs> only asking questions, you know, because if you're talking, you don't learn anything. Mm. You learn if you ask questions. Mm. And when I sat there with a, with a potential client, I didn't talk much to this, but I listened what he wants and all this. And then if I ask someone that I'm not good in sales, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm not so good, I'm not a good talker, I'm not a good speaker. But are you good in, in, in listening? Yes, I am. So this is much more important. There's some misunderstanding what is really important to be good in sales. Who is here in, this, in the sales business here in this room? Some. I don't know. Would you agree with me that it's more important to listen to what people want than, than to speak? What is your opinion? Yes, you think absolutely. It is this way. So there's, but of course it's important to sell. It, you know, this is also I mentioned Arnold Schwarzenegger and what he said. Whatever you do, it's worth nothing if people don't know about it. Yes, whether it's in bodybuilding or whether it's in in politics or. or people have to know. So this is why I'm sitting here. I wrote this book. They published the book. Some authors think, okay, I published the book. Everything is done. No. Then it has to start. People have to know about this, this, uh, this book. You have, to, you have to do something to, to sell it. And this is with, with, with everything. And yes, it's even, for example, I don't know who's married here in the room, but when you ask your, your later wife, to, to marry, it was also some, I, I, I don't think that you did it, you know, brushing your teeth in the morning, hey, what do you think about marrying? So, oh yeah, good idea. <laughs> I think most people wouldn't do it this way. They would think about before, where should I, should I how should I do it? And where, it's is sales, the same. The, the number three the, the, uh, is be a non-conformist, not... Yes, but, abs uh, absolutely, be a non-conformist. You should enjoy swimming against the stream. I tell you, I, I, I mentioned this friend of mine with uh, you, uh, Theo Müller is his name. He became very wealthy with five billion with uh, with milk and with yogurt, and he has a funny story. He, he told me, imagine you know his favorite animals are cows. Of course, cows because he became rich with milk, and so his story is about cows. And he he told me, imagine there's uh, there's a path. And there's uh, with 100 cows walking along this path. And on the left hand, there's um, 
very lush and green field with a lot of grass. And on the right hand, there's a field that is not as near as lush, only some grams of grass. And 99 out of this 100 cows, they go to the left hand. Left, left side, and of course what happens, the grass is eaten very fast, and as one cow goes to the right side, and this cow eats and eats, and that I'm the cow go to the right side. Or I'll tell you another story. Uh, a friend of mine, his name is Jim Rogers, he's uh, famous for commodities, he became very rich when he was young because he managed together with George Soros the quantum fall, and this fund made uh, 4,500 4, um, um, a percent at the same time when the S&P had 42 percent and uh, later he, he, he became famous because he traveled all around the world three years with his motorcycle but he, when he was young how he became rich he told me this story he was invited when he was very young to a famous dinner in Manhattan and the other bankers investors were very wealthy and old and rich and he was the youngest and one said to his neighbor, not very loud, but so loud that everyone could hear it, how can someone be so stupid to buy locket chairs? And everyone laughed because these locket chairs were plumped down and every day you could read bad news. Everyone laughed very loud. And he said, I didn't feel good because I was the one who bought them. But five years later, he became very, very rich with his investment. And he said, lessons learned, the louder the people laugh at you, the better it is. And I did the same to buy real estate, residential real estate in Berlin. In the beginning of the 2000s, the Deutsche Bank, they didn't want to find it. This is a crazy idea. Please think twice about it. And, and everyone told me from so-called experts why it's a bad idea. But I had the idea, uh, I had my analysis why I believed in it. And 10 years later, I bought every property for at least four times more than I bought. Uh, I sold for at least four times more than I bought it. So, and this is, you know, I think it's logical to be a nonconformist. If you do the same thing as everyone else, you will get the same as everyone else. You can't become rich or 100 million if you do the same thing as everyone else. I think it's logical. So being nonconformist, very important also. No, number four is to take ownership on, on your failure. It's never blame others or, or the world, no? which is yes. quite typical. No? A lot of people, every loser does it, you know, or was bad at school, okay, my teacher didn't like me, didn't make a career in his company, my boss didn't like me, it's rather, the, the, uh, he knows everything about the mistakes of the, of the company, or if he, uh, you know, didn't pass through the driver license, the teacher was also bad, it is every, always the others, or it's capitalism, or racism, or sexism, or the parents, or whoever. Losers always blame other people. They, they don't take responsibility for their own life. And on the first glance, it make, maybe it makes life uh, uh, easier. I, I remember when my sister, she was this kind when she was young, and she hit her against the table. She had a ah, bad table, so it, it, but it wasn't the table's fault. And um, successful people, this was also one result of my interviews with these rich people, they take responsibility for their success, but also for their failure, also for their setback. And even it is true for countries. My next film, you know, I produce also some films will about uh, Vietnam, and I wrote my, uh, one of my last books about Vietnam and Poland. <laughs> and I, I've been in Vietnam several times, and a lot of people don't know, it, but in the 90s, Vietnam, for the poorest country in the world, poorer than all African countries. They had not the war only with the United States, before that the war with France, then with Japan, with China, and what was not destroyed by the war was destroyed by their terrible planned economy. But in the end of the 80s, they saw something is wrong. All the other countries, they are South Korea, and so they become rich, Japan, and we are still so poor in spite of communists promised us how great it will be after the victory, but this didn't happen. And they could blame, of course, 
the Americans, but they love Americans. We know it with Poles and we know a few people, they love Americans. In the, the, you have much more anti-Americanism in Germany and France, maybe also in Spain, than you have in Vietnam. They could blame them, but they didn't do it. They thought it was a crazy planned economy because this is what they could change. Though they start with economic reforms, uh, with private property, free market reforms, and at this time, the number of people living in poverty in Vietnam was 80%. Today, it's 3%, from 80 to 3%. And so it's, it's for individuals, it's for countries. Don't blame other people. And I, I, I had a meeting with an ambassador from Vietnam uh, some month ago, and I, I told him, I admire you, yet that you don't blame uh, Americans or France or uh, so, and he said, yes, but you have to know, we were in war with almost half of the members of the United States Security Council. If we would bet with everyone, it would bring us further. And uh, number, number five is uh, focus. But you mm, explained that focus for you is, is different. It's not doing, not saying always yes, it's uh, saying many, many times no. Yes, this is what I learned when I read uh, these uh, biographies about Steve Jobs. This is something that he said. A lot of people think focus is to say yes to some things. No, it means to say no to a lot of other opportunities that you have every day. I think it's the same, you publish books. If you would say to every author who sent you a book, a manuscript, I think this wouldn't be... Uh, good way to be successful. So to be successful means to say no to a lot of things because you know they, they will not work. And sometimes it's hard to say no but because it is an opportunity and you could do it, but this time when you do this, you can't do another thing. And I, I read also this biography about um, Warren Buffett, you know, who's one of the big, greatest in, investors in, in the United States. and and. In the biography I read, there was a, a dinner in the evening, Warren Buffett, and then uh, Bill Gates, and the father of Bill Gates invited them. And he asked both of them, what do you think, what is the most important thing why you became successful? He asked both of them. At the same time, both of them are focused. For them, it was crystal clear. They had, they had not to think about it. It's focused, and it's clear. It's the same you know, for example, if you do, I don't know, is there someone here who does something like martial arts, like uh, karate or kung fu? It's for example, when I was young, I did uh, karate something. Now, some months ago, I started with, with kung fu again. And you know, if, if you punch, it's like this way. It's only there. It's, it's focus, yes? This is how you can even destroy bricks. But if you, there, it's, this is focus. And uh, this is all, it's all about focus. And uh, well, we are getting to the to the two and, uh, last ones. The, um, I think this this is very important because I always thought this is the maybe the best strategy. That is uh, be, being honest. That you you what you say is that uh, you need to be honest mostly to win the trust of others. Yes, you know I Ro Rockefeller was at this time the richest man and one of the richest in history, and they asked him, what is your secret of success? And he said, the secret is that I trusted other people and made other people trust or have confidence in me. This was the, the, the most important thing. And I think everyone who is in business knows it's all about other people trust you, your business partners, your clients, the bank, maybe, your employees, people have to trust you. And this is so very important. And the question is, how can you win the trust of other people? There are different possibilities. Of course, if you're a great actor, even if you're dishonest, like Bernie Madoff, you know, who mm. fools with this. OK, then you, can, you don't have to be honest. If you're a great actor like him, you can fool other people and make a lot of money. But fortunately, most people are not great actors. You see it in their face <coughs> if they lie. Everyone knows it. When you talk with someone, you don't know exactly why. But you see, I have a bad feeling with him. I don't believe him. 
it's your gut feeling, and it's you know it's a because I I spoke with someone uh, who, who who analyzed it. The reason is because the words what you say is one thing, but there are hundreds of muscles in your face and your voice and how you look, and if there is a discrepancy between both of this then people get this negative feeling. And so the easiest thing <coughs> to convince people is if you're honest. And even if you, you know, you know if you sell something to people and you say, everything is great and this and this, no. I, I saw people who were very successful, even they, they informed people about the, the negative side because th th this belief, I wrote in Germany my autobiography about my life and I wrote also about the mistakes that I made and about my failures and why did people believe the other things because if I would draw I was always everything successful and everything great no one would believe it because you know that it's not true and a lot of people think that being dishonest is very important to become rich I, I commissioned a poll in 13 countries, also in Spain, and we had a list with personality traits, positive personality traits, like being intelligent or industrious or honest, or negative, like r ruthless and a lot of negative, greedy. And we asked people, what do you think what applies to rich people? And the least mentioned personality trait in every country was being honest. I, I remember in Spain it was like only, I think, 1% said honest. But then we did something different. We asked these people, do you know rich people in person who have at least a million? Do you know them? Then we asked them, and what, what is about this person? About, and then they were like, for example, I know, I know the number in Germany, 3% said rich people are honest. But if you ask the people they know, it was 42%. So it's a kind of negative <coughs> stereotype. It's a prejudice. It's what like leftist people tell you maybe. The rich people, they became only so rich because they fooled other people, because they are dishonest. And for some people, it sounds good because if I'm not financial successful, oh yes, because I'm such a honest and moral high standing person, so I, uh, I couldn't be, even I prove it that I'm so honest that I'm poor. It's even the proof for this, but we know it's crazy. I think being honest or not has nothing to do whether you are rich or not. It's not this way, I do, not in Germany, and I'm very uh, convinced also in Spain that in this, you know, where you have the the most expensive villas and houses or mansions, that they are only shady, dishonest people, and then they're in this, you know, uh, with this um, displaced neighborhood or so, where you find a lot of, you know, uh, you know very bad neighborhood that all these people are like holy and moral, high standing people. No, you find it everywhere. Of course, you find rich people who are honest or not, but I think the easiest way to win the trust of other people is being, being honest because then you don't have to be a good actor, be, 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 be honest to other people. It's easier. Um, the last one is, um, I think, if, if we think we start with the with uh, big goals, I mean high, but the last one is to be persistent, is to, but not, use what you say, is not doing always the same. Try, but uh, but play. No? Yeah, yes, you know you can read it in a lot of books about success. You have to be persistent, and they have the stories about people like Walt Disney or Steve Jobs or Elon Musk who were very persistent, who didn't give up. And of course, it's true that persistence is important. But I know also people who are very persistent in doing things, but they never are rich, like a taxi driver who's very industrious and doing a lot, very persistent. But, you know, if I go there now with persistence, always, you know, to put here my, my head against the wall, I, I don't believe I will destroy the wall, only, only my head, even if I do it uh, very persistent. No, I think the real secret is the combination of persistence on the one hand 
and the willingness to experiment, on the other hand, to try several things. This is how people like, for example, Edison became successful. And it's also for a company. I, I, I don't know much about your company, I, but I think if you founded your company, I, I, I think maybe some things that you tried that, that did not work, and you so they do not work. We have to do some things were different. It was the same when I founded my company. I had some ideas, but after a year I saw a lot of these ideas were not really good, so I had to do it in a different way. And this is the same like um, if, you go to the, if you go to the gym, for, for, for example. You know, I'm here, I, 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 I can show you. I go now since uh, 47 years to the gym, yes? And I'm <laughs> here, I'm, 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 I'm now... I'm 67 years old, but still have good muscles. But, and I never took any steroids or something, never in my life. But why? Because always, you know, I combine this persistence. I go every week, like, four or five hours to the gym, maybe only for a half hour, but also with the experiment. Try to doing things in a different way. And this is the way how, you know, hopefully I have now better body than I believe most other people in my my age, and this is because I combined uh, I, I, I combined both of them. I think Schwarzenegger may envy you, no? No, no, <laughs> no, he's still, no, no. <laughs> uh, now, um, I want to, to change a bit the, the topic, because there is something that, that we, we share with you, and not mainly in this book, but, but you have done a lot of uh, work and a lot of effort trying to to defend and to 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 pray that uh, wealth wealth and being wealth and, and wealth for the societies is something good and you were telling a bit uh, before that the many times people even try to to to, to avoid explaining that uh, uh, success and um, it's easier to explain that uh, being rich is because you have luck rather than, than other things. And, and I think you are, you are committed on, on, on explaining that uh, there, are, there are things that we are losing in this uh, modern society that are going to be bad for the, for the future. You, de you defend the capitalism, you defend the, the free market, and also you have a book that is translated like Los Ricos and the Opinion Pública. For you, I think it's important to, to, to improve the, the view that the society has on, on that uh, people that, that uh, has been successful and, and is a bit above the, the average. You told me a story a bit uh, when, when we were coming to the to the auditorium that is interesting, that is the, this idea of the dystopy that you are uh, creating like a, as, a, as a new book, try to explain why mediocrity is, uh, is something that society most of the times prefer. No? It's about the... Uh, yes, yes, of course. It's, um, I don't want to write... The secret for my next book was... No, it's a secret. Can, don't, don't, can, tell, don't tell. But, but, no, but, yes, it's, it's true. I, I, you know, my, 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 my last... One of my last uh, books in English, it's In Defense of Capitalism. I think in Spanish it's a little bit different title, Defense of Market. Yes, so... And it's published now in 30 countries all over the world, and I've been in most of these countries and to, to promote capitalism. And, but first of all, I think capitalism is not so important for, for rich people. It's much more important for poor people. Because the strong people, they come along in almost every society, even in a very crazy society like Venezuela today. Even there are rich people who have a good life there, but for the poor people, and there are 80% now in Venezuela of very, very poor people. For them, capitalism is the only way to improve their life, and this is what a lot of people, they don't understand when they think capitalism is only for the rich people. No, it's much more important for poor people. They have no other alternative than capitalism, and there was 
not one single socialist society that improved the living conditions for poor people. But there are a lot of examples from capitalist societies, uh, societies that added more capitalism, that improved the life of people. And I think people understood it in the end of the 80s, after the collapse of the planned economy, of socialism, of the Soviet Union, and after they ended in China their crazy Mao Zedong ideas. And almost everywhere in the world, you know, I have here this T-shirt with uh, Maggie Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, for example, and there were a lot of uh, people who did economic reforms. And Deng Xiaoping in China also, yes, he, uh, when, 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 he, when he started with his economic reforms, 88% of people in China lived in extreme poverty. Today it's less than 1% uh, because of free market reforms. And so I think today it's exactly the opposite. Almost everywhere in the world we go, as I see it, in the wrong direction. More state less market. In China, with the Xi Jinping, they go back to more state, less market. They will have some problems. In Europe, with its crazy ideas from Brussels, every day we get some <laughs> new crazy ideas, like the last one, to, to ban the registration of combustion engines. What is, you know, we in Germany, we were proud of our Mercedes and BMW and Volkswagen. Now all these companies become big problems. And uh, they have the plan next year, they have to pay a penalty of 15 billion euros to the European Union because they didn't fit to their idea. So it's, and this is, I call this a planned economy because what's the difference between a free market economy and a planned economy? In a free market economy, companies decide what to produce. But in the end, it's consumer's choice. You know, you decide when you, when you use Amazon, you make Jeff Bezos rich. Or if you use Google, you make Larry Page and Sergio Prin rich. And if you used Microsoft, you make Bill Gates rich and so on. If, if, if not, not. And so in the end, and the contrast <laughs> is in a planned economy, politicians and government officials, they decide what to produce. And if you think that politicians are the smartest people in the world who are smarter than all entrepreneurs and all consumers, then you should be for socialism and for a planned economy. But I don't think that politicians are so much smarter than everyone else. And so I believe that we are on the wrong track. There are only a few examples. Like in Vietnam, they go more in the direction, more market. And I hope now in Argentina, and you know about Javier Millet, I think he was also here in Madrid and has his lectures. And I'm proud because he's also a fan of my, my books. I, I learned first about him three years ago when I read an interview with uh, Millet in a newspaper and I haven't heard his name, but then I saw uh, with Google Alert, my name is mentioned. And they asked him, what are you doing this evening? I go home and read a book from Rainer Zittelmann, Capitalism is not the problem. Uh, but the solution, but of course, in Spanish language, he, he read it. And from this day on, uh, so this was the word first I learned. And I, I hope he will have su success. I was this year here, last year, and the, the year before. And it's uh, the attitude that has to change, you know. That the big problem in Argentina, but also in Germany, maybe also in your country, that a lot of people, they expect everything from the government. So they believe... I want to have everything for free from the government. But young people, and these are the people who support Millet, they started to understand it. And I, when I was there three years ago, I, I thought, I, I, I tried to explain it, you know, this is my, I'm a, I'm a scientist, I'm a scholar, I'm writing for like economic affairs and like the scientific journals, but I think I'm also able to, able to explain sometimes things in a simple way, even that young people 20 year old can understand it. And, and I, I remember this is a little bit of a funny story maybe only for, for, for this question, what went wrong? I, I had there this lecture with uh, 
maybe like 80 or 100 young people in Argentina. And then I was, there was someone, here's no one uh, looking not so handsome, there, there was a young man sitting in the first row, that's maybe there. He, he wasn't really handsome, so I thought maybe he has no girlfriend. And then I asked him, here, do you want to have really a beautiful girl, uh, do, you ha do we have a girlfriend? I said, no, I, do, I don't have one. That's what I expected. And then I asked him, but would you love to have really Beautiful girlfriend. Oh, oh, yeah, he said. And then I asked him, but would, what do you expect who will bring you this beautiful girlfriend? The government? The state? And he laughed. No, I, I, I don't believe it. And then I asked him, but what do you think who's responsible to getting this beautiful girlfriend? He said, I think that's me. Yes, that's all. You don't have to know more about my philosophy because this is not only with this girlfriend, it's with money, it's with everything else. Don't expect it from the government. It's on you. And so he understood it. Um, I want to 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 do a, maybe, maybe the, the last question because we have the the cocktail upstairs, and but there is a theme that is been in in Spain at least I think everywhere uh, a kind of an issue that is uh, all the things related to inheritance. The the you to, you talk to this in the write about this in in your book. Um, and the thing is, the question is if it is right or is not right, or how it uh, has to be taxed. But you, what you explain uh, is that uh, the, 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 the money that you inherit, you have to also run properly this money. The, 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 the tool on the, on the bad uh, management is that you uh, end up having no, no money. So there is a kind of... A, a natural regulation on, on that. I recall a sentence that uh, I think it was the the title the title of a book written by a, an American in the last uh, in the at the end of the of the 19th century. That is a, a, fool, a fool and his money don't last very much together. Was the the title of this book. So there is a kind of a, a challenge also for for the money that is in, in, in inherited. No? Yes, this is what I mentioned before, that people who are not rich, they always underestimate uh, how difficult it is to stay, to stay rich. Oh, I'm rich, so, and uh, no, it's not, it's not easy. You see that most of the big fortunes, they've gone away, of course, if it is very much, it can take it a long time, but it's not as easy as, uh, as people think. And I think this is a big problem. I would like that some of these famous soccer players, for example, that you have here in mm -hmm. Spain, the, the, the best in the world. I, I don't know much about their finance, but I would imagine in a lot of cases it's very bad. Mm -hmm. So because I know it's, it's in a lot of countries. Because they focus, what I understand, all the time of their soccer training. Mm. But if they would maybe spend only 5% of this time to be reading books like this, for, for example, and, uh, or come here and listen to these topics. But they think, um, I, I, I have here someone, he, he does everything for, for <coughs> me, I give it to the bank or um, something like this. No, I think you have to take also responsibility for your own financial situation because if you understand nothing even you you can't make a difference whether someone you want to work with to uh, to manage your funds whether he's good or bad if you don't understand nothing you you can't choose the right one so i think it's uh, financial education is very important and this is the reason why i'm i'm writing my books to 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 give something to people and I know there are there are some people that let him talk I, I I know everything or I have my banker he knows who, who knows everything and I, I don't need it or it's too complicated or so no I I don't think it I think you should also have some knowledge maybe some people have fear because they think that there are in such books maybe complicated mathematical formulas, but you read it and I think you can confirm there's not a single mathematic formula, so don't be afraid. If you could understand what I explained this evening, 
you can 100% understand my book because I think this is my ability, even if things are complicated, and some of these things are complicated, to explain it in the way that hopefully, even sometimes it's a little bit entertaining, but more <coughs> important that people can understand and get the message. Well, Rainer, I think we, we cover more or less the, uh, a good part of the book. I think uh, the... Oh, I, the I don't hope so. Then no one will buy it. So no, no, don't tell it to you. There, there's a lot of things that we haven't mentioned. No, no, this is, this is what I was about to say, that the, the best part of the book is, uh, are already hidden. So, yeah. so you, you need to, to buy the book and also to do another thing, that is to read the, the book. And uh, we are going to, uh, upstairs. Uh, you will have time maybe to, to sign some of the books. I, I want to have you here back as soon as possible. And uh, we would like to, to, to greet you with a very big applause. Thank you. Thank you.